Okay, now we're recording. So everything that happened before this was off the record. <laughs> um, please wipe it from your minds. Um, yeah. But this is the night of magical friendship. Of completely magical friendship. Um, I think Chen and I have been like, you know, we got really sad um, when Gesundheit came out because we had a tour planned. We were going to go to four cities yeah and we had flights booked and um it all got canceled because it came out right before the pandemic and, and then it was like oh I guess we're going nowhere <laughs> um we did one in-person reading right was that just the that was the release party. the release party in Chicago yeah it was like oh my god it's released okay <laughs> and Jan read it that oh my god yes <laughs> beautiful <laughs> so we're really coming like full circle <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're just so excited to be able to do this um, and with our wonderful uh, co-readers for this event. Um, we're such just stunning talents and amazing people. So we're super, super grateful that they've joined us for mm -hmm. this. Um, so yeah, let's jump in. Yeah. Our first reader is Muriel Lung. Um, so I'll introduce Muriel. Um, with her official bio, and then we're each talking a bit about our friendship with each of them. That's a theme for tonight, <laughs> a friendship a adventure. Friendship. Um, yeah, so Muriel Leung is the author of Imagine Us, The Swarm. I'm so excited for this book. Forthcoming from Nightboat Books and Bone Confetti, winner of the 2015 Noemi Press Book Award. She is the poetry co-editor of Apogee Journal and co-hosts the Blood Jet Writing Hour podcast with Rachel Cruz and M.T. Vallerta. She is a member of Marissa Collective, a feminist speakers bureau. And Andrew W. Mellon Humanities and a Digital World Fellow, she's completing her PhD in creative writing and literature at the University of Southern California. Mm -hmm. So I met Muriel in 2014 at the Kundiman Writers Retreat. Um, beautiful, beautiful space. Um, I remember she was dressed to the absolute nines, all in black with a leather jacket. I think a bold red lipstick, if I recall correctly. I was so stunned and delighted when Muriel struck up a conversation with me. I don't remember what we first talked about. I just kept thinking, she is so cool. <laughs> Am I cool enough to be her friend? I'm so glad. I'm just so tickled <laughs> that we've become friends. Um, Muriel's work means the world to me. Her work creates worlds in which both grief and future making are given room to roam, to be at once fully felt and rigor rigorously thought. So please help me in welcoming Muriel to this friendship adventure. Ugh. Thank you so much and Thanks. congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> congratulations to you both. I feel like um, Sam, even though like we just met today, never we haven't had a chance to meet me in person. I feel like I know both your friendship like so much through social media and you know, social media can be such a hell place, but I think some of the bright spots is just seeing you two like share a lobster roll. And it's like, this is like the moment, these are the moments that like give me joy. So thank you for allowing us to witness that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, in honor of and Sam, I wanted to read something super queer. Um, so I actually am gonna read an essay um, that I wrote a while back um, and it's part of a new collection I'm working on. And it was um, recently published in the Texas Review's all, um, all essay issue. And this is called Obsessed Unbound. In nearly every creative writing class I have ever taken, the opening advice has always been this, write your obsessions. In other words, write from the place where you repeatedly return to the most haunted caverns of your life, whatever feels perpetually swollen with noise. For how banal this instruction seems to be, it also appears to demand so much, its muchness where the writing is said to thrive. Obsession is an understatement. In my life, I have obsessed over things, people, logical spellings of the universe, objects without consequence, but which through inexplicable reasons still possess me. Questions someone asked once that punctuated the air between us and which have left me forever appended. The ways in which a faulty love consumes me wholly, absolutely, and begs me to be obliterated. To be obsessed, I believe, is to abandon all of yourself just to be close. 
I had always known the bright intimacy of letters, which was a type of abandonment. Someone once said that when I wrote, I looked lost. Um, I blushed at this image returned to myself as if someone has seen the rush of blood and guts in me and described their textures and sounds aloud. I was 12 when I had my crush on the poet Jane who came to her language arts classroom weekly to teach us about the difference between collaging and extended metaphors. She invited us to write to her long after her sessions ended with us. And so I found her website, we featured a forum for anyone to ask her anything they wanted. She would always post her response, exquisite letters that exploded the questions, made each inquiry feel like they had always intended to bloom out into their full majesty. I wrote her, dear Jane, what are teeth? Another time, dear Jane, why are people so mean? And once more, dear Jane, why does Hello Kitty not have a mouth? Always she would respond, because animal, because hurt, because the accidental color red is another type of resistance. It was she who told me once that after having her heart broken, she dived off the lifeguard station in Coney Island onto a pile of glass. She sustained no physical injury, but the devastation of the heartbreak that stayed. I thought that love felt ordinary to me. At 12, life felt unbearable. I was full of desire, but convinced that no one desired me. When Dee and I first met, we wrote each other constantly. 13 miles may mean nothing to some, but in Los Angeles geographical terms, we were essentially a long distance relationship. When we would finally see each other, we would watch the sun set and rise from bed, touching, yes, but mostly the passage of time was fueled by my questions. Who were you when you were younger? What do you fear most in your life? What gives you hope? What do you have in plenty to give to others? I would ask the questions and they would answer the hours sliding past us that we would forget to eat, delay going to the bathroom until our bladders became uncomfortably full and sink ourselves deeper into the mattress. I forgot myself there. What comprises queer Asian American psychic life, I'm convinced, is a state of constant deferral of self until its total abandonment. Rarely do we speak of obsession and queer Asian American psychic life how this wanting shapes our interior architecture. How appropriate that Raymond Williams calls his affective consciousness the structure of feeling, referring to the ways in which our understanding of history is never fully aligned with our emotional and psychic comprehension of what transpires in real time. Always, affect is about delay of experiencing sensations after the fact. Of course, then, it is always building within us, and always it arrives too late. We are already rearranged. Thank you. Oh my god. Hey, <laughs> so stunning. Wow. So moving. <sighs> Thank you, Muriel, for sharing that piece with us. Gorgeous. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so good. I'm just like taking it in mm -hmm. all right rearranged rearranged completely so our next reader sam will introduce oh why it is the most lovely wonderful jan henry gray <laughs> is the author of chapbook selected emails and his first book documents was selected by d.a powell as the winner of the boa editors a poolin junior poetry prize born in the philippines and raised in california where he worked as a chef jan lived undocumented in the u.s for more than 32 years most of that time was spent in loud kitchen loud kitchens and dark movie theaters an undocu poets and Kundi Mon fellow, Jan is currently a visiting assistant professor at Adelphi University and lives in Brooklyn. Adelphi, Adelphi, don't actually know. Um, <laughs> I was going to talk about Jan. I mean, Jan, gosh, there's so much to talk about. Um, Jan and I met in Chicago. I don't exactly remember where we met, but I know that we clicked very quickly. 
And Jan invited me to his house party, um, which was also a celebration of selected emails coming out. And I remember going there and talking to him a lot and there was a rainbow cake. Um, and <laughs> we just really, um, yeah, we, we really connected about food, about butts, about joy, about um, just like strangeness and performance and dance. Um, Jan's one of those people that I feel like um, has so many interests that um, just like, and is so good at talking about those interests and talking through them. Just really, um, I feel like I could talk to Jan on the phone for like 10 million hours and I often want to. And then he's like, hey, it's been an hour and I need to go, goodbye. <laughs> so um, give it up to the number one cutie of my life and of the world, Jan Henry Gray. <laughs> I'm clapping um, because everyone else is clapping. Um, Sam, thank you. Chen, thank you. Congratulations. And um, there's a small possibility that the doorbell will ring because I don't know if we timed the Thai food properly. So it might happen during the reading. Live. Um, OK. OK. Um, Okay, um, it is also really nice to see so many people in here, or at least your names and your um, bits of uh, chat. All of it feels, feels, it feels peopled in here. Uh, this poem's called Meat, M-E-A-T. To avoid touching, I'm gonna start over. Is that okay? Let's just rewind. This poem is called Meat, M-E-A-T. To avoid torching the skewers, soak overnight in water. To guarantee the lean meat tender, steep in a marinade of vinegar. Too much acid will gray the outer flesh. Temper it with something sweet, say honey. Something grounding, say soy, add smoke, tomato, or black pepper. Pepper is a bridge between two flavors. To marry cherry juice to cinnamon, boil both with whole cloves. Clove of pepper, clove of garlic, elephant, garlic, heart. The language of the heart is stupid, inarticulate. It needs tending tendon, time, a night in, sealed. Before slicing, let rest. So much happens to flesh, it's brief time exposed to so much fire. Um, gonna have a drink of water before this next poem because it requires more saliva than I sometimes have. I'm a good person because my childhood was junkyard, goodwill, crushed cans, buy one, get one free, reruns, dead leads in the pool, no lifeguard, landlord, no English, bounce check, smog check, two, no need, three jobs, back entrance, under the table, no right after school, loud dogs, mean neighbors, no neighbors. Someone died there for rent sign up for months. Rusted carts, bruised fruit, free bones, just ask for beef tongue, for chicken broth, for chicken hearts, clouded eye of fish on ice. We fry it extra crispy. The house smells like this and Windex and roses from the rose water bath to heal the kidney. Traffic. Church is packed, late for church, not going to church, news of a shooting, news of a robbery, news of a shooting, news of the boy raped at prom, pictures of the teens in court, animals, those crying parents, his crying parents. Rodney King, Reginald Denny, and everyone's yelling on Ricky or Jerry or Maury or Montel, and Oprah is, she's on the cover of her own magazine. 
dentist office, insurance voucher, no social, permanent address, temporary address, magazines with the address torn off. It's your first time, the handsome dentist says. He touches you and you feel special and rich and white and American and healthy and taken care of. Take care because I care. Keep in touch. Have a nice summer. We'll be friends forever. Never change. I think it's impossible to be invited to anything uh, Sam related and, and Chen related, especially Sam and Chen related, and not be in the space of fruit. This is, um, this is a poem I wrote for class. <laughs> I'm taking a class on forms and um, I was like really uh, resistant to even take it. Like one, I had to have no, no extra time. But um, I was like, uh, I don't wanna learn all those forms. I don't want to learn those forms, <laughs> but I'm learning those forms, or I'm not learning them, I'm using them, I'm using them. Um, but we had to wait till almost the end of the semester to get to uh, the guzzle, so here we are. <laughs> guzzle of oranges. For New Year's Eve, my father overfills the baskets with fruits, only round ones, grapes, grapefruits, pomegranates, and oranges. January 1st, he cranes his body out the window to let the new year in. In Chinatown, the red bags are full of greens and mandarin oranges. In the fallow season, the farmer kneels to know the soil, more silt and sand. He mumbles to himself and his dog, it's time to give up oranges. The woman knew she let herself say too much to someone undeserving. Her penance left on her sister's doorstep a case of the most expensive oranges. At the Whitney, I take a photo of a poem in a book behind the glass. Above it, the painting, smears of blue, something something Frank O'Hara and his messy oranges. The handsome server speaks with his hands. Tonight is grilled octopus served atop a salad of fennel, green olives, cress, and supremes of oranges. No one at the table looks up, ashamed by the prices on the chic menus. The busser fills my water, and I inhale him, a faraway scent of oranges. In seventh grade, we learn to read the smog alerts. Red is danger, stay inside. White is safe, play outside. I forget what orange is. Clutch was serious about art and said our final projects can be whatever, performative, like show up with a wheelbarrow full of oranges. In all those first six years, Jan, why is the only thing you remember the mist rising in the sunny air as he watched her peeling oranges. Thanks. Sam, in the space of fruit. Mm -hmm. that was... Well, you brought it. You really did that. You brought it <laughs> to the space of fruit. <laughs> You amplified, intensified yeah. the fruit of the space. The fruit of the space. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Ah. <laughs> just, I just want to like <laughs> lie down and curl up in the space of these words. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Spend a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Friendship. Friendship. I know. <laughs> key, <laughs> We're just going to keep saying Yeah, that. key word, friendship. <laughs> so our next reader oh. is Sarah Gambito. Mm -hmm. 
who is the author of the poetry collections, Love You, Delivered, and Matadora. She is professor of English, director of creative writing at Fordham University, and co-founder of Kundiman, a nonprofit organization serving writers and readers of Asian American literature. So Sarah, I also met in 2014 at the retreat. Um, I was immediately and just completely uh, struck, bowled over by her energy, a zinging zestful warmth alongside this deep clarity about a set of commitments, a commitment to writing in community and writing as community, a commitment to non-hierarchical dreaming and gathering, a commitment to experiment and abundance. Sarah's work is full of fierce insight and raucous music, also recipes, glorious recipes. Um, Sarah also blurbed our chat foot. The advanced praise. <laughs> it's like the best fucking blurb. In the world. You know? <laughs> The best blurb that ever blurbed. We changed our title because of the blurb. Yeah, we actually, I, I don't we, think you we, know this, Sarah, yeah. but we uh, changed the formatting of our title um, because you had put it in all caps um, and we hadn't initially thought of it in that way. But then seeing it, we we're like, yeah, all caps. <laughs> Every single letter must be capitalized. The exclamation point is not enough. Yeah, no. In this case. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not just Gesundheit, you know, saying it to, you know, a regular old friend. Mm -mm. Um, it's Gesundheit. Gesundheit. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for the title, yeah. actually. <laughs> I didn't do that. I love that so much. Yeah. So welcome to our friendship adventure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so good to be here um, in the space of fruit. Um, we need we need this so, so much. Um, so I am just so thrilled to be here to celebrate Chen and Sam and to celebrate Gesundheit. Um, so if you haven't bought your copy yet, um, buy your copy because it's fabulous. It's beautiful. It will make your world. Um, and I was thinking about what to read today. And you know, honestly, OK. I'm just tell you a quick mini story and then I just thought it's friendship right so I thought I'd bring a friend with me through a poem and um this this is a poem oh my god you guys I was I was like 22 and I moved to New York and I was so broke <laughs> um my uh professor an undergrad he was like Sarah if you want to become a poet this was Tonlin he was like move to New York <laughs> He was like, just be careful that you don't get mugged though. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I guess I'm moving. Anyway, so I was in New York and I was really lonely and I was broke and I would go to Barnes and Noble and <clears throat> and read poetry. And um, I found um, a, a book by Mary Oliver. And um, here's this poem. And when I read this, I was like, this is for me. Like, I felt like it was like specifically for me. Um, okay, so here is a poem that is a friend. Um, this is called West Wind Two. You are young, so you know everything. You leap into the boat and begin rowing. But listen to me, without fanfare, without embarrassment, without any doubt, I talk directly to your soul. Listen to me. Lift the oars from the water. Let your arms rest and your heart and the heart's little intelligence and listen to me. There is life without love. It is not worth a bent penny or a scuffed shoe. It is not worth the body of a dead dog nine days unburied. When you hear a mile away and still out of sight, the churn of the water as it begins to swirl and roil, fretting around the sharp rocks. When you hear that unmistakable pounding, when you feel the mist on your mouth and sense ahead the embattlement, the 
the long falls plunging and steaming, then row, row for your life toward it. So I love this poem so much. I was like, I needed it so much. Um, okay, so uh, I'll read a short piece. Um, it's called Virginia. I'm from Virginia. Um, for me, like um, the last line I thought was, you know how a poem kind of won't hold together and no matter how much you do, it, just, it won't become itself. Then all of a sudden a line just drifts into um, your side vision. And for me, um, it was the last line, which became a direct address. Because oftentimes I, you know, you write towards an intimate other and then, but then the poem came together because it, it the you became very, very important. And so for me, this, this is a poem um, about friendship, about being able to tell, um, to speak of that which is difficult to speak of. Um, okay, here we go. So this is Virginia. We were brown and immigrant. We drove a Volkswagen and sang songs in the hymnals of white people. We loved these songs and God was pinned to the underside of my skirt like a blood orchid. I loved a boy named Philip. My mother sent me to his house with 100 egg, roll, egg rolls that she fried herself. We kissed until my tongue was tired. I didn't know that, that the tongue could get tired like any muscle. I wore my own clothes on Halloween. I smudged my eyes with eyeliner and dotted my neck with two black dots. What are you? A victim. I flapped my arms like a pinwheel. Solar winds flooded me. I didn't dare to think that I could not belong. I was a wrapped baby of a kind of Oriole. Wiping the sun's juice off my face, I balanced on a pencil drawing of health insurance. I wanted to be a poem, ox-like. My family rose up against me, incensed. I could think of nothing else, love abounding, love abounding. If my family met a poem, they would really punch her in the face. Huddled around the one bulb of health insurance, I said I wanted to be a poem. The poem played piano. Her arm muscles moved and she opened her voice and I knew she loved her husband, her children, her dog, her country. In this song, I saw the chips of Micah in the asphalt. I held the cans of Super Saver. I touched bankruptcy and rusted bike chains, the tiny dot of my sister on the Palomino of school leaving and then coming back again and then leaving ad infinitum. I had a brass portrait of the Pieta, her lambent and impassive face looking down on the broken body, the, <clears throat> the broken language, the deep kelp of not belonging. Together we watched the tide go in and out of the fresh sewn batteries of our country, a draft of this poem would be good to read, to send to you. Just wow. Just wow. Wow and woe. <laughs> I am wowed. I am wowed. Oh my God, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> how can we go on how can we live now but at the same time we must go on oh gosh <laughs> so, i don't know if i can <laughs> oh. thank you thank you thank you for your words <sighs> so how does one segue to a powerpoint <laughs> we we did not discuss this we didn't so clearly. let's like talk about this reading a little you know mm -hmm. we put together this reading um because i think chen and i have like found in our friendship that we've like discovered a joy and a beauty in life that we didn't have before you know and we've been thinking a lot about different ways to like share that with everyone and so then we made a powerpoint <laughs> Because we're like, there's so many photos, so many memories, <laughs> so many things, so to many moments. <laughs> Just 
little little moments, big moments, <coughs> large and small, medium even. Yeah, whelmed, so, whelmed, overwhelmed. Yeah, not underwhelmed. Um. <laughs> so, <laughs> are you ready? This is our PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> oh, let's share it to the PowerPoint. Yeah. Press that one. Uh, you're in the second one. I thought you were the first one. Oh, you saw the second one by accident first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is Sam and Chen's marvelous friendship adventure <laughs> through points of power. Through the points of power. <laughs> let's get to it. Let's get that in the bottom. Let's get to it. I put that there. <laughs> Should we have done this at the beginning of the reading? No, this is the right time. This is the right time. Yeah. The um, right time is now. The right time is now. This is a story <laughs> about how two creative people met creatively at the creative location of the Yiddish Creative Book Center. <laughs> These photos are of Sam and Chen just weeks before meeting in 2014. I had just graduated from college, as you could see in and my little- <laughs> I was standing by a body of water. <laughs> <clears throat> we formed an unexpected, fantabulous, totally life-changing bond on the runway called life. If you can see in the back, the two of us are there, along with the tent creative writing cohort, um, which is where we met <laughs> at yeah. the Yiddish Book Center. It was a writing retreat for people interested in like Jewish American literature under 30. Yeah. Oh, it was under 30? Yeah, it was under 30. I forgot about that part. Yeah. So we were all not 30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it should be open to people over 30. I agree with that. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> there we are in all our blurry glory. We were so happy we became blurry. Yeah, we were so happy we became blurry. <laughs> Oh, did we skip one? Did we skip one? I think so. Oh no. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> and <that laughs> we did not rehearse going through this PowerPoint. We're doing great. great. So the spontaneity of it. <laughs> and then very quickly and extremely tickly, we banded together to face the writing knowledge of this world. <laughs> um, these were both of our author photos shortly after we met. Mine was taken at Tank Creative Writing. Mm -hmm. Mine was taken in San Diego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And also we were big gay cuties in the world. Oh, this is the first time Chen came to Chicago. Yeah. And we beautiful. were at the Dyke March together. It took forever to get there. Yeah, because you had to take two buses. I took two buses. It took like two hours to get there. <laughs> yeah, I drove. Yeah, so you got there faster. Get <laughs> fast. Um, extremely gay <laughs> and extremely outside. <laughs> this was in like this weird alleyway um, that was next to well, it was like in your, in it the was, back of your apartment yeah. building. And we were um, sort of invited to this very strange uh, party yeah. for Pride. One of our neighbors was having a Pride party and we got invited and there was like a lot of rich 45 year olds who had really fancy food. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> we, that apartment was incredible. Was we ate so well. <laughs> During some of our hardest and most plentiful years, we learned to be there for each other, to support each other's dreams, and to bring each other joy. Like when we ride. This little, was in Lubbock, Texas. <laughs> we rode these um, animal go karts around the mall. Yeah, for quite some time. <laughs> we got matching cleavers as presents, and we famously were connected by scarf. <laughs> <laughs> by a long scarf. Yeah. I mean, there are like hundreds of photos we could use. <laughs> this one is also in Chicago. <laughs> From AWP to, oh gosh, a mummy. <laughs> <laughs> this, the mummy was just from this week. We live to collaborate. We collaborate to live. <laughs> we believe in the magic of queer friendship, the hot sorcery of sonic frolicking, the too fast, too furious of pop referentiality, the comedy of citrusy collisions. We believe in radiant play. A manifesto. <laughs> uh, this is our official bio. Yeah. We recently redid this joint bio. Yeah. Yeah. Chen Chen and Sam Herschel Wine, he, him, he, they, 
are the bestest of best friends, though they are annoyingly long distance. Sometime in the, let's hope, not too distant future, they will live in the same city. Cough, New York City, cough. <laughs> gorgeously, blossomingly. They will eat omelets and talk about Ricky Martin's foot fetish and go to Paris. <laughs> Jen and Sam have written a collaborative chapbook, Gesundheit, which is out now from Glass Poetry Press. And this is our glorious Gesundheit reading. <laughs> the international implications of this. <laughs> Okay, now time for the reading. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for indulging us at our PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. <laughs> oh my God, the comments. <laughs> oh, wow. So we're going to read some from Gesundheit. We're going to read some new stuff. Um, and we're going to have like a blast. So I'm going to go first. I'm going to read this poem called The Entire Scoop. Because you can't have just part of a scoop. You need the entire scoop. Middle school awkward limbs. Seventh grade drama teacher asks we make a one minute play and the group immediately decides. Sam sneezes. Students as trees gusting to fall, full societies that topple over hills broken from the sheer force of me, of my nose. I cock my head back so far. I whirl my face to the ground like a collapsed doll of boogers and eyeshadow with every fold or crack of my ribs, crack of the release and the snot globs in masses around me like a moat. I'm the sneezing kid nobody likes. I'm a wet golden mongoose at lunch. No, sneezing isn't the entire scoop. I was also a sissy and soft, sensitive, and so my, uh, uh, oh, achoo, oh, I'm sorry, moments were so easy a target. And maybe that's what this is all about, how I hated even the smallest inconvenience, like my snot, my billowing lips, how I was tortured and oddball and me, how I thought for years it was just my nose, big Jewish schnoz, the problem, how I didn't realize they smelled the difference, saw within me uneasiness, a young, queer boy snorting under desks, holding face tight with two fingers and scrunched, a collapsed wreckage after trampled roses, a gown, ruffles like squids that fan out, a pretend fortress, the only one I've concocted that can keep me safe and sinking. Oh, <laughs> so good to hear that one. I know, I don't think I've ever read that before. Oh my God. <laughs> so now I'm gonna read. Will they, won't they, will I? <laughs> Just got overwhelmed by my own poem before I even started. Will they, won't they, will I? <clears throat> will they, won't they kiss, date, finally fuck, fight, have fun making up, out, have such fun mocking some made up, take out business villains, Asian accent. Will they, will I reproduce the scene here? Will I, by reproducing it, rerun, renew a fucked up, overdone laugh? But who is laughing? How can you live in New York, Seattle? Okay, Scranton maybe makes sense for nine, 10 critically lauded, commercially successful binge watch by me seasons. But only fuck here, see people of color when it's boring subplot, somehow related to white protagonists, breakup, engagement, new dog week. There was a week I was mistaken for three other Chinese, not Chinese, but still Asian, I guess, people. There was a week the senior editor of a prominent progressive journal asked if I was related to another Asian poet, someone with my common last name, my very common face, apparently. There was a week or five I did not want to say hi to any white people. Wanted to stop seeing, hearing yet another fuck up and downplay, another non-apology. Wanted to stop all your irony, comedy, commentary, all your symptoms for failing to see, all your synonyms for failing to hear, see me or a success depend on being able to fuck, giggle over the me you think must like you, like you do, would do you. Why don't you try to pronounce an R in Chinese? Japanese hi actually is pronounced differently in the two different languages, but I don't want to reduce, reproduce Asian as East Asian, be your new cultural chauffeur, racial tension masseur. I want to break your mouth, my ears, the screen displaying, replaying the boy, my first boyfriend who paused said, wow, you don't know what chink means. Chinky eyes, people say it all the time here where the Chinese are taking over. Will I ever be over that? I learned a racial ethnic slur from my first boyfriend. Mm -hmm. He said, I like your eyes. They're not really chinky eyes. Why did I say thank you? 
Why did I stay with the boy in college for two years? The one who said, but they make fun of everyone on the show. Some things are just funny. Asians are short, shy, small. Am I reproducing it yet? Is my suffering me successful now that is seen by the right white eyes? Is AWP so far from Hollywood? Don't I secretly hope for a TV deal based on this very poem? 24 lyric episodes in which an immigrant mother, father, queer immigrant son finally fucking screams, fuck you. You try leaving everything one, every one love, every, every love, face, laugh, leaving, starting over, 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 over. You try that, then say every letter perfectly. Mm. That is one of my favorite of your poems. <laughs> oh God, that is so, so good. Yeah, this is Gesundheit. We're reading from Gesundheit. Uh, beast of a friendship chapbook. I'm um, having trouble finding the poem. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find it, okay? <laughs> it's on page 32. <laughs> um, I'm gonna read a little one called Not All Poems Are Forks. Not all poems are forks, but each of them have teeth, prongs, sharp silicone. All poems are lubricated. Most poems pull the lamp under the table and expect, inspect the family's toenails for a murder scene. I'm tossing my hair with orange peels and scented paint. If I were an art installation, I probably wouldn't be able to hold still. If I were an art installation, I would invite all my friends and they would be the art installation too. Stick a fork in it, it would be called and we'll gather outside the state senator's office. Forks with leaves dance in our hands. Look how peaceful, it's art, the inside bu building people will say. So they let us in. We chew out their eyes. We start a fire and riot and eat what's left with homegrown tongues. Ooh. Little one. A little one. <laughs> I'm gonna read a little one. Yeah, read a little one. This is this called The Chateau? <laughs> People in soap operas always have more than enough candles for dramatic dinners, for lovemaking, for dramatic post-lovemaking spats, tiffs, perhaps even squabbles. It's possible, all thanks to candles. I would like to have a more candlelit life, but unscented, s'il vous plaît. From the chateau of my steamier life, I ask, where do they go to buy new candles? When do they have time? There should be at least five episodes every season devoted to the restocking of everyone's candles. From the chateau of my smutty luminosity, I worry. What will they do if they have to sit without candlelight, without their faces lit just right? How will they accuse one another of being their own father? I put on my chapeau, my post-coital glow. My every suitor wishes to propose, but without candles, it's just post-coital tristesse, or not even that. Imagine if they replaced all the candles with fluorescence. They would have to become a forensic crime show or a sitcom set in a dentist's office. Teeth would certainly be of great importance in either case. <laughs> um, should we still do this? I don't know, we have a few poems left. It's okay. Let's do it. Yeah, so we thought it would be a fun idea if we both read a poem by each other. Um, because we like inspire each other a lot, I feel, and a lot of our poems are in conversation and- And grow out of conversations. Yeah, yeah with, with each, each other. other, like this one. <laughs> so <laughs> these are both poems that we've written based on a conversation with the other person. <laughs> so Chen wrote this poem. It's in the persona of Sam. <laughs> <laughs> called Self-Portrait as a Wild Extrovert, <laughs> which is me, I'm a wild extrovert. Um, so this is Chen's poem that's written from my perspective. <laughs> Self-portrait as a wild extrovert. I have 600 dear friends. I hug each of them daily. I never need a mint, but I'm always ready to offer one or 600. I love and know a lot about biking slash baking. I really do. I love and know a lot about Celine Dion. <laughs> Thanks to my mom who is, if absolutely had to pick one, but who am I kidding? Of course, she's my best friend. Once every five years, I might feel a smidge of sadness. And when I do, I just sit down, maintaining impeccable, approachable posture. That's not true. And breathe. I breathe like the very well-organized, 
very wall-less ad agency I've run since birth. I breathe like breathing is my oldest dear friend named Daphne. Daphne, whom I still call every night before bed to say, you are an incandescent multiverse. Don't you forget it. And that never fails to do the trick. <laughs> oh my God. It's so funny hearing it from your voice. Yeah. Because usually I read the the name Daphne Daphne is like one name. <laughs> <laughs> Daphne Daphne. <laughs> yeah. My dear friend Daphne Daphne. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm reading a poem of yours. Yeah, the inside job. Oh my god, <laughs> this poem. Let me tell you, it's too good. Pages said, "Gonna find it." I found Find-in. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is in Gesundheit. The last one was not. So I'm the friend in this poem. <laughs> the inside job exit strategy. <laughs> I had this friend talk to me for hours about eating a butt. It was his passion, his call to arms. He wanted it to be mine. I started talking butts with the boys, the ones on my dates. They like butts just fine. They kept squeezing mine. My butt is bubbly and quaint. My butt has a lot of issues. I'm reclaiming the Twitter trend, hashtag trying not to fart. A boy wanted to finger me after I had just eaten macaroni and cheese. I'm lactose intolerant. A boy tried to lick my butt after cooking me an onion filled tomato sauce. Another wanted to taste my insides after we ate an entire baguette. I have trouble with gluten, more so onions. Please understand. I'm not a top for stopping your hands or mouth, just an overly active bottom. Let's talk about poop and farts and my diarrhea. It's our first date, but let's scrub first in the bathtub. Let's use soap on our fingers and ask before digging. Let's discuss a cave in the Alps. It's opening hard to find, not discovered by a lot of divers. The fish, (laughs) not discovered by a lot of divers. (laughs) The fish have a story first. Let's hear it in full. Let's learn the history of a place, at least with our tongues. The anatomy, a braille, mostly for taste. The tonguing history clicking with syllables and salads and synchronized bowel movements. <laughs> look, look what you've inspired in me, you know? <laughs> you've brought something so important to my life. Um, Wow. That poem. <laughs> that poem. Wow. Should we skip these next two? I feel like we're doing a lot. No, how's everyone doing? Should we keep going? No, we're just gonna, okay. we're gonna. We're gonna do it. No, yeah, we're gonna keep going. <sighs> wow, the comments <laughs> sustaining me. Oh my gosh. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I always try to like read something new when I read uh, readings. So this one is pretty new and then we're gonna read another one that's even more new. Um, this poem is called, as you know, my first chapbook was called Fruit Mansion, um, which is very special to me and it's now out of print, which is sad. Um, and so I was feeling a lot of feelings about it being out of print. So I wrote this poem (laughs) called Vegetable Condominiums, which is like Fruit Mansion, but it's vegetable condominiums. (laughs) We're two cauliflowers jumping over the cracks in the sidewalk. We're two asparagus needling our way between fences to run across grasses that are private. You make like a carrot and kiss me under the football lights like we're in a movie. The movie is Salad Spinner's Gone Rogue and I'm a lead actress. I put the fun in fondue and ice skate outside in the summer because I've decided the weather isn't real. You ruffle my hair. I smack your stomach again and again, telling you to stop. You have a sheepish grin like a lasagna. I tell you, I'll hightail my ass out of this messy concoction, out of this exuberant anomaly. You and me, unlikely superheroes, rescuers of inappropriate refrigerator storage. In our vegetable condominiums, we do the worm across all the floors. We lie face down on the rugs and sing Cheryl Crow into their furs, into the cascading rays of an endless afternoon. This poem. I think about this, you, I feel like inspired Mm. a lot of this poem, Mm -hmm. actually. I remember you saying you were worried that you had <laughs> stolen something from me. But I you thought hadn't. one of the lines was yours. I Googled for yeah. like and 20 minutes. <laughs> I was like, I know I took this, but, but I did it. Yeah. It just took from the energy. Of I you. love that poem. Yeah. Thank you for reading it. Mm-hmm. When am I reading next? Oh, the this poem. Thing. Am I ready to read this? <laughs> I don't know. Are you ready to read? I don't know. I don't think I know this. <clears throat> Oh, this is my horse poem. Oh, your horse poem. Yeah, this is really new. The Galloping Thing. Don I now my gayest apparel, 
my best denim on denim outfit, to watch you work in your medium of paper on paper on paper, you and your pair of red scissors at work, making a medium large parade of tiny, tiny horses. You worry. You're worried, you explain, about the ratio of pageantry to melancholy. I say, but aren't you glad? Don't you feel just head over the moon heels to be making something? You nod, then sigh. And I'm reminded of my own nod slash sigh combo, my own worrying. But when will the next galloping thing come? Was that last hoof my last hurrah? Oof, says the gay ass gallop in the disheveled field of my chest. Remember, he says, inspiration is constant, is how you breathe in the world. Always more world to breathe in, no such thing as block. Don't say you're blocked when you're forgetting your own breath. I laugh, then watch your hands cut out grass blade by blade, snip by snip, bit by bit by bit, smallest, palest grass, like flecks of winter, or strange dandruff, fallen from the head of some eternally neighing god, and just look at you playing with it. I mean, look at you praying. Mm. Oh, that ending. Yeah, it's my horsey palm. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I know that one. Yeah, it's super new. Ugh. Yeah, should we just we'll, we can read the poems, or we can read one that we wrote together. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Should we skip that? Yeah, eggs? we'll skip the we'll skip the eggs. Okay. Cool. <laughs> no one knows what that is. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing eggs tonight. Okay. <laughs> we both saw this amazing exhibit. <laughs> um, that was it was like these drawings <laughs> of yeah. an egg on a journey like through realms realms multiverses multiverses and we were so moved by it that we both wrote poems <laughs> based on these eggs based on the eggs yeah so um, we'll if yeah we can do that at the end after the q a if people want to stay around we'll do the eggs but we'll skip it yeah for now for time's sake let's end on our collab poems mm -hmm. so something that jen and i have really um i think from early on in our friendship we used to do what we called fab collabs which is where we would email a line back and forth. Um, and none of those poems were ever- They were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but they taught us yeah. how to do that better, I think. Mm -hmm. So that when we were in person, yeah. we could we really write learned collaborative how to collaborate. poems. And I think really shine. Mm -hmm. So we were gonna read two of our collaborative poems. Usually we like try to practice and go line by line back and forth, but we were really busy today and we didn't yeah. get to do that. So we're going to do this differently. Yeah. But with this poem, what did we decide? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let's just take natural breaks and the other person will jump in. I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try it. Yeah, we'll try it. Okay. Who's reading the title? <laughs> <laughs> I will read the title. Okay. So this poem is called, Now More Than Ever, We Are In A Moment Of Time for Sylvia Plath's typewriter. Should we tell the typewriter story really yeah. fast? So Chen and I met at 10 Creative Writing and... Um, they took us to the rare book room at Smith College and I walked in and I saw a typewriter in the middle of the room and so I walked up to the typewriter and I typed P-O-O-P or the word poop um, and then the woman came in and had us all sit down and she pointed to that typewriter and she was like this is Sylvia Platt's college typewriter. <laughs> you didn't know. I did it. I truly did not know. You I didn't just... know that you were contributing to literary history. I didn't to Plath's archives. I hope they save that sheet of paper, honestly. <laughs> oh my God. So I typed poop on a Sylvia Plath's yeah. typewriter and this poem is based. So it's dedicated to <laughs> Sylvia Plath's typewriter. <laughs> now more than ever, we are in a moment of time for Sylvia Plath's typewriter. Thou moppest the way I wish to be mopped. Slinking along the floor like a wet turtle. Oh, wet sound, oh, wet look. Just before in a happier time, we grated cheese. Who knew such harmony could be harnessed by a long shreds of cheddar? Who knew that six years ago in Massachusetts, two young gays would collide before Sylvia Plath's typewriter? Upon which one of the young gays ceremoniously typed poop. Who knew if Sylvia Plath's typewriter had ever received such scatological messages? In my sweet December exhaustion, let me recline and recall these faggy serendipities. These genre-defying shit jokes. Oh, wet look. Oh, oh wet, wet sound. sound. <laughs>
<laughs> we did it. <laughs> we did so it good. fell into it. Yeah, naturally. Yeah. <laughs> so here's our very last poem. Yeah, of the night. Um, this poem is really, I feel like really inspired by Sarah, actually. Because um, you met her at AWP. I met her at 2019 in Portland. And um, I think we just... Yeah, me meeting Sarah, you were like talking for days. You were like, you're going to meet Sarah. <laughs> and I think it was just like such an amazing buildup. And then it was such an incredible meet. And I think mm -hmm. it felt so. Yeah. So we wrote this poem sitting on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. um, like reflecting on everything yeah. that we've learned from our communities. This is called Hibiscus Knowledge. You're to Ugo Gay, I know <laughs> To Ugo Gay Apsme, the nearest park while finishing a bowl of chicken livers. I asked for the 14th time. Are you reading the oh, whole first yeah, half? Sorry, I'm not I doing this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna start that one over. <laughs> Hibiscus knowledge. To Ugo Gay Apsme, the nearest park while finishing a bowl of chicken livers. I asked for the 14th time. Is this green? Is this hibiscus? I was getting very full. I was confused by the handsome helicopter overhead and you slurping thick ice cream through a narrow straw. The sound like two cars stopping, not quite stopping, stopping, not stopping, on the verge of love or healing or brightest ancestral birth. The apsme couldn't show me, so I had to show it. My body by the water, like a dropped frisbee, waiting for me to notice it to attend a ceremony of the first trees to startle, not yet April, not even nameable. You, me, else whomst, quite possibly your favorite neighborhood mailman in jogging shorts, but not jogging, sitting by the water, holding each other, circulating a bushel of how to heal in reverse, a bushel, a bushel of, of tea tongs. And that's the Gazente reading, everyone. <laughs> yeah. oh, so let's do the Q and A. Yeah, we prepared a Q and A <laughs> for our panelists. I'm um, so excited to learn everyone's answers I to these questions. I'm very excited. Um, thank you, Muriel, for posting Gazente link in the chat. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. um, the questions. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> We thought we would like sort of go through each person and ask these questions. And then when we're finished with that, we can like open up for some audience questions. Um, so we'll start, we'll like go one at a time, like the question mm -hmm. and then we'll each answer. So. so the first question, so this is Jane Wong's question. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, thank you so much, Jane. <laughs> yeah, so what is a snack that makes you feel powerful or maybe capable of magic? I wanna get one. <laughs> You're getting the snack. I am getting that line. Okay. But keep going. <laughs> yeah. So who wants to answer first? A snack that makes you feel powerful. Oh my god, the rustling is so loud. <laughs> I can share um, a snack. I'll, I'll attach a link to it. Whoa, it's a really long link. Um, I didn't expect that. <laughs> this is um. So this is a link to. Um, the salted egg salmon skin um, chip. And it is, uh, this is like apparently the extra crunchy version. I learned about this actually this weekend because Dan Lau, who is a Kundee Mon fellow and one of my best friends, speaking of friendship, and I went on a little trip, this is in my pod, and um, we were driving on the road and he brought um the salty food snacks and then I brought the sweet food snacks and I was driving and he was like are you hungry and I said I'm feeling a little peckish and then he just shoved these chips in my mouth and he didn't even ask um <laughs> he didn't even ask I want them or he didn't even tell me what they were but I was like these are delicious and he's like jump, jump, jump. <laughs> and uh I was just I I asked him afterwards once I fully parked my car and was able to swallow and digest my food, what they were. And he was like, oh, you know, like, oh, this is just like, you know, the chip that I thought everyone knew about. And I've actually never seen it in any Asian market that I've been around, but it's so, so good. And 
um, I'll forever think about um, Dan force feeding me um, now with those chips. I highly recommend everyone try it who doesn't mind um, a little MSG and, and uh, protein, fish protein. Oh my God, this snack. I love that it's extra crunchy. And I love that you discovered it through Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, I have to get this. I haven't had this before. Me neither. Yeah, thank you for this pro tip, mm -hmm. honestly. It's actually salmon skin. It's not like salmon skin flavored something else. It's actually salmon skin. I was just reading a thing. I've never, that sounds so good. Yeah, right? That sounds miraculous. Truly. Beautiful. Yeah, favorite, or that's, yeah, a snack that makes you feel powerful. I have one. I don't know if it's a snack, but um, it's a snack. The word snack is malleable, expansive. Um, I really, really, really love um, this snack slash meal, which is um, leftover rice, soft scrambled eggs, and furikake and hot sauce on top because um, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's like a meal. You, I almost always have eggs. If I'm lucky, I have leftover rice from like maybe the night before. And for a cocky, just sort of like hangs out on the shelf seemingly forever. And I love that this feels like a meal and a snack. And it costs maybe like 30 cents a bowl to, if you were to sort of food cost it. Like, um, and I just love it because it's like nourishing. It's, um, what's the term? Um, I like things that you, where you can use things that are like shelf stable. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I love a pantry. I love the idea of like things you can like reach for at any hour of the day. Um, so that's my, that's a that's a snack that I, I feel resourceful when I um, when I make that for myself. Mm. Sounds so good. Can I take a cooking class with you, Jen Henry? Um, like yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, agree about like shelf stable, like because then you're like invincible. That means that you just you've got it down. Um, I love that. My um my snacky is not so fancy and so, and I was like, do how do I talk about this? Um, I love Cheetos. I love Cheetos. I am crazy for Cheetos, and I think they're kind of filthy. Like they just get everywhere like on your hands on your mouth and it's like you have to like lick your fingers which feels like you know what okay crunchy or puffed i don't know that's like i don't know like very i don't know like i'll take anything but sometimes i'm very firmly like puffs and then very firm like no 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 it's got to be the crunchy okay so they're just kind of filthy they're kind of too much nothing is supposed to taste like that um so when i eat them i just feel like I'm getting away with something like I feel like I shouldn't be doing this but I'm doing it anyway and I always tell myself because I always buy the big that oh I can't believe I'm telling you this, the huge <laughs> bag and I'm always like just have a little don't eat the whole bag but like I eat the whole bag like every single time um when I was pregnant my husband he <laughs> he was like what are you doing he was upset that I was he would take them wrench them from my hands and put water in it because he knew that like I would probably go back in somehow and find, <laughs> find this bag you know what I can't do flaming hot but it's it's just more the extra but like super cheddary super mm -hmm. like whatever maybe it's because I eat so many of them if I ate the flaming hot I would probably injure myself <laughs> um so it's a kind of all or nothing thing for me um so I don't I don't have sprinklings of Cheetos in my life. Mm -hmm. I have like, like boisterous, like filthy love affairs with them. And then I just can't look anymore. Oh my God. Filthy love affairs with Cheetos. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. So good. Wow. Do you want wow. a like fun hack for eating Cheetos without getting your fingers dirty? Is using chopsticks, actually. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to take the so dirty good. experience away. You, Sarah, it feels like it's part of the experience, but if you must. Ah, um, I never thought of that. So <laughs> also really good for um, the shrimp, the shrimp chips, 
that are mm. like the, the short french fry shaped ones because sometimes you don't want shrimp powder on your keyboard. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do. It's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Powder, food powder on your peripherals. Like it's, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that can be part of the joy of Cheetos I as well. So. Yeah. Is the dirtiness. Like the yeah. finger um, suckingness of it. The finger suckingness <laughs> of it all. Of it all. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Do you want to share yours? I mean, I had a bag of mine, so I just got them. But I feel really powerful when I eat honey butter chips because they just taste exactly like honey and butter perfectly in oh, a magical I those. harmony. We're going to have these after. We're going to eat these tonight. <laughs> I saved them. Thank you. For this reading. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I just, I've never eaten a chip that I feel like it gave me two flavors, like honey and butter, and mm. the two were so perfectly represented, and I tasted them both. They're on equal footing. So wonderfully. And that's important for me mm. Um, mm -mm -mm. as a weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> Is that I want to, like, experience all the things that I was told I would experience. Yeah. Taste. Yeah. What you need to taste. Yeah. Yeah. Mine um, is shrimp chips. Yeah. I have which those you have also too. Here. <laughs> I brought a lot of snacks. <laughs> um, yeah. Shrimp chips or like prawn crackers. Um, just the boldness of that flavor emboldens me. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel powerful. Yeah. Thank you all. These answers are so, so good. Fabulous. Ugh. Yeah. I'm going to be thinking about Sarah's <laughs> Cheetos poem for like the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> so our next question, um, which we're so delighted by, is <laughs> What's the, next the favorite sea creature. Oh yeah. What's your favorite sea creature and why? I kind of want to. I'll go first, actually. Yeah, go first. Um, I'll go second. I was thinking about this, um, so I'm obsessed with um, Gudetama, um, which I don't know if people know about. Um, I feel like I actually learned it first hanging out with Muriel. Um, I think in Los Angeles, and we were like finding a gift for another friend. I think we were finding something for Monica Soak. Um, and we came across the store and it had all these, um, yeah, the, the cutest lazy egg, exactly. I don't know if Gudetama is a sea creature. I just really wanted to answer Gudetama. <laughs> So, I forgot that you were really not answering the question at all until you said that. <laughs> you forgot what the question was. Yeah. I'm just obsessed. Okay, cool. Because Gautama is so just blasé. Yeah. Could be a secret. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the story of Gudetama. Mm. I don't know their life history. <laughs> Um, I know that they're supposed to be an egg. Um, and sometimes it's like a fried egg and they like, well, yeah, it's always a fried egg and they like lie on their, um, the white. Um, it's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining Gudetama as mm -hmm. like a mermaid, mm. you know? Um, that's, that's how I feel. Yeah. My um, sea creature is definitely a manatee. Um, I'm really into how they move, like, like they're just like, and they like just kind of they get so vertical. Yeah, like oof around, and I relate to that. I feel like that's how I want to move through the world, it's kind of just like a floating beast um, who just like gives some pushes every once in a while. Um, Manatee. And, yeah, I feel sometimes like I when I sway past people they're like oh my god what is that um but that's what manatees do <laughs> but emily what's a blobfish it's <laughs> another slimy entity i mean probably i i mean just the name alone blobfish speaks to my soul so thank you so much yeah who else wants to go yeah favorite sea creature i'm googling the blobfish right now it kind of looks like um, Ditto from Pokemon. Oh, oh yeah, that's the vibe. Oh, yeah, wow. that's the vibe I'm going for. <laughs> I love Ditto. Sarah, what's your what's your sea creature? I, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this, and then I remembered this fact, and then I was like, I will choose this as my favorite sea animal: seahorses. Um, mm. so, um, I love, um, the kind of 
sharing of um so okay so the female lays eggs and the and the male um uh uh is pregnant with them like holds them all and then so they're born from the male so i love that kind of cooperative sharing of birthing um i really yeah so that i'll choose i'll choose the, the seahorse that's a beautiful answer it is. Reason. yeah the cooperativeness mm -hmm. the giving and the taking mm -hmm. yeah and sharing mm -hmm. communal yeah Jan, how about for you? Favorite sea creature? Um, aesthetically, the octopus. Mm, but aesthetically. Because I um, like to wiggle my way around certain questions. <laughs> I'm going to also pick the uh, beaver, who is not a sea creature, except the beaver does so much work in water. Mm. And it's almost like the beaver gets wrongfully categorized in the animal kingdom, I feel like. Um, so the beaver, because they're industrious. <laughs> and I feel like, you know, speaking of like cooperation and like sharing mm. duties, mm. like the beaver is like builder, protector, dam maker. Um, they create spaces for each other. Yeah, like community, like organizer. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And furry and adorable. Wow. I mean. The beaver is one of my favorite animals, just in general. I love that. Oh my God, thank you for reminding us of the beaver. Thank you so much. Wow, incredible. Yeah, Muriel? I was trying to think, I wanted to think of like a cool animal. Um, and I was like, I was like Googling the deep sea creatures for like an hour before this reading. So I wanted to come up with something really cool. And then I um, realized that the answer is like much closer to home, which is the sucker fish. Um, that you have in your like uh, fish tanks. They're like the ones that you get that clean your fish tank like, naturally. The I, was just, <laughs> oh my I was like nature's little janitors. <laughs> and I'm like, nature's little janitors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Applause to that. <laughs> I was just like, they, they labor. Like, so I'm just like, do the stuff that was like unseen, but like, you know, it's really vital mm -hmm. to survival of the space. And they don't like really ask for much. They just like, they're just, they just survive and they just chill. Like, they don't like, you know, and I think they, they turn what's like, um, like waste and then they make it into something that mm. looks like beautiful. And I love that creativity too. Ugh, that reminds me, we were just talking about Jenny O'Dell's book, How to Do Nothing. And one of her arguments in that book, you know, is you know, for valuing um, the labor of maintenance, right? Um, maintaining spaces. Um, yeah. And yeah, I just think of that creature, right? Mm. This one that yeah, maintains an ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? maintains like a living space. Um, ugh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Their like biological name is the Bacostoma, which is a word that I want a spelling bee with when I was really young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always loved that word anyway. I love that. <laughs> oh my God, Muriel. <sighs> Are you there? Oh no, Muriel maybe froze. Maybe, huh? maybe you froze. <laughs> oh no. I hope you come back. <laughs> we have one more question. Mm -hmm. What's the last question? What is friendship? Oh yeah. Mean to you. How has it been for magic for you yeah. and for your writing? Yeah, what is friendship too for you and for your writing? Oh, Muriel's back. Um, sorry no you're no okay. you're great we, we were you. just so enchanted by your answer <laughs> <laughs> we we're just continuing to ponder it and think about it um yeah so our last question yeah when or how has friendship been magic for you or for your writing i can go um i'll just say like friendship where you can really let your hair down when you don't feel like you have to protect yourself or like you don't have to parse your words um it's so life-giving and uh so when joseph and i 
we're working on Kundima. I just love that nothing was off the table. Like, you know what I mean? You know, sometimes when you're just like, should I say this? Is this weird? Or you don't, so you're just like, oh, I, maybe I don't say that. But like, I just felt like with Joseph, I could always just say anything. And then if, if he wasn't like, yeah, that's good. He would like even make it like, oh no, let's make it even mm. bigger or weirder or whatever. And so I, I think I told the story a little bit, um, but um, in the first Kundiman retreats, we had this thing called poetry clinic. <laughs> I was like, I just liked writing it in there. And I was like, it'll be like a clinic. And you know how like you, you call someone's name and then, and then they come forward. And so we had these stations and so people would bring their sick poems. And so we would sit down and like nurse these poems together. And I just thought this was so fun and 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 and, and funny and, and delightful. And I even I bought um white coats. <laughs> I bought white coats and I was like, where are the oh coats? My God. And I was like, it's too much. Like that I couldn't do. Like I brought it to the retreat, but I was like, it just it's it's a little too much. But I love that I could say poetry clinic. And like Oliver de la Paz was like, amazing idea. Jen Chang was like, amazing idea. And like, I just felt like I, you can do like these expansive, amazing things. And, um, and we need each other right now. Um, the world is being remade and we need artists. We need friendship. We need the bigness that um, friendship offers to us. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just so happy to be here to celebrate. Mm -hmm. Chen and Sam and celebrate this chapbook and celebrate with all of you. Oh, thank you. I'm like Sarah. melting. <laughs> I am melting. <laughs> I'm a puddle. I think you should bring that back, the white coats and the clinic. <laughs> Were there little clipboards? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that we had clipboards. Listen to your poem. <laughs> Listen to the heartbeat of your poem. Tap, tap your palm's knees. <laughs> tap, tap your palm's knees. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh my God. That idea, it's that concept. Amazing. Wow. Life changing. That's art. That's art. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that, um, like, uh, I really love, not abstractly, but in practice, I really love um, emailing friends. <laughs> And I really love sending letters, whether that's in an email or a really long drunk text message thread, or if it's like something you post that you know you're really just winking at someone else in your world. And um, so like all kinds of communication. And I feel like um, it's been great to, sometimes I feel like emailing a friend, especially when I haven't seen in a while, is the best way to like start a poem. Mm without trying. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking of like Jennifer S. Cheng's like email, the emails we've had before. I'm thinking of my friend Chelsea, who I email very sporadically, but I feel like our emails feel like I become closer to like a poetic space than uh, when I try, when I know I'm trying to write a poem. Um, it's harder there. So I, I like it as a sort of valve I guess that sort of like lets some of the water flowing. Is that the end of that? <laughs> okay. I don't know what else is flowing, Jan. <laughs> you tell me. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. And your chat book, selected emails. Yeah. I was is just thinking of that. Too. An incredible example of that. Mm -hmm. And something that I hold very dear. And when Jan gave me this chat book, he was like, you should only read this when you're pooping. So I have it in my bathroom <laughs> and I read it often when I'm pooping. It's great <laughs> bathroom literature. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it, keep it on a shelf. Yeah. In the bathroom. Mm -hmm. a companion. Yeah. I don't know if I should have said that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's the space of friendship right there. You said it. It's a, what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Muriel? This is like the most time I've thought about butts in a single reading ever. <laughs> I love it. I'm like, I was just thinking about butts this morning. We <sighs> wanted to create a space of abundance for butts. <laughs> yeah, abundant butts. But discourse. <laughs> a butts reading. Yeah, a butts reading. <laughs> the next theme, in fact, 
It's buns. A button. <laughs> a button. <laughs> I'm surprised that the PowerPoint didn't include pictures of like side by side butts. Oh. oh, next time we, <laughs> we did miss that opportunity. Wow, thank you. <laughs> yeah. See, Muriel always knows what's missing, yeah. what needs to come into the picture. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Rooms for room for growth. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm thinking about I was thinking about the question though today, and I I you know I love like everyone's answers so far about just like how. And then, like, I think it's emblematic in, like, your friendship, too, like, how you, like, Jen, Sam, like, you both, like, are able to kind of, like, like, speak to each other's minds. And I think, like, it's, it's beautiful and friendship can be so generative. And for me, it's, like, it's also, like, the opposite is also really, really, really important, too. Like, recently, like, during the pandemic, there's just been some struggle with writing and, like, my identity as a writer. And I... There's a period of like now, like, you know, graduating soon, hopefully from my PhD program and wondering like, will I ever write another book? Like, or, or, or is writing books always going to be about, you know, entering it into a market? And then I had several, when I, you know, said that out loud, several friends wrote me and they're like, we still love you, even if you wrote, never write a book ever again. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, that was like, so like, I mean, that's not, you know, going to happen, but it's also like, so so like comforting to hear that it's like the spirit of our work is not you know in this one object but actually it lives through just like who we are and um our ability to keep on as a poet or writer is not um solely about creating an object but actually just just creating for creating sake Mm -hmm. so it was just a really beautiful reminder and, and i love friendships that remind me of that and so I'm, I'm, it's just been really great to hear, you know, Sam and Jen, you both like echo your friendship, which is like, you know, came, you know, there's an object that came out of it, but also the conversation keeps going. And that's really beautiful and inspiring, I hope, for everyone who's watching today. <laughs> I moved. I'm so moved. <laughs> you know, like to be perfectly honest, um, Gesundheit, the chapbook, we still don't really know what it is. <laughs> we just um we're so excited to work together. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a part, you know, what what true friendship is. Mm-hmm. Like you just have this excitement to collaborate to dream together to make something together um so I mean the first draft of this chapbook was absurd I mean it's still an absurd (laughs) chapbook but it was just like looking back on it I'm like Mm. this makes no sense um but we are just so happy to do it it was so enjoyable Mm -hmm. it was so such a pleasure and a thrill to work on it. Um, and it's that feeling um, of, yeah, as Sarah said, like nothing is off the table. Everything is on the table. <laughs> it's a large table. It was a big table. <laughs> um, it's the biggest table you've ever seen, not available at Ikea. Um, it's a table you create together. Aww. That's friendship. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it feels really special to do this reading with Chen because I think about when Chen met me when I was 22 and fresh out of college. (laughs) Yeah, we were such baby poets. We were. I didn't even know I was a poet yet. Chen kind of was the one. Yeah, you were in nonfiction. You're like, you don't belong in nonfiction. You're a poet. (laughs) I was like, me? (laughs) Um, But I just feel like I had lived so much of life not really ever knowing like what made me happy and what I liked um, and just kind of like going through a lot of motions for so long. Um, And I feel like friendship was the thing that found me and was like, you know, you can do the things that you like and you can find ways to exist um, like in a better way and more joyfully. And um, you don't have to do that alone because you are really bad at doing things alone. I'm really bad at doing things alone. I I'm like such a wild extrovert (laughs) and um, I always feel better when I'm doing things with people that I love. Um, And so I built like a whole network around myself of 
people that like to do the things that I like to do or didn't, but like we support each other in doing them. Um, and so friendship for me was my way of starting to like release into the world. And um, it's been really special. And you've been a huge part of that, you know? Especially with the writing. I'm I mean, gonna cry so much. I I'm gonna sob all night. <laughs> we are. We're gonna sob for the rest of the night. That was the plan. Hug and sob. This. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you like helped me see that writing was the first thing in my life that I really loved, and that you could prioritize it, mm -hmm. and that I was allowed to. Yeah. And that that was special. And then I learned how to do that in all the parts of my life through learning how to do that with you. So <laughs> no, I can't, I can't handle this. That's my story. Okay. Well, we're ending <laughs> <laughs> because I can't handle, <laughs> I can't do this in front of people. <laughs> But you can. But I can in front of person. Yeah. A person. <laughs> and our lovely friends yeah. who are here. Oh, <sighs> thank you all so much. Um, yeah, Sarah, Muriel, Jan, um, for like agreeing mm -hmm. <laughs> to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one of those things that maybe felt a little wacky um, or maybe a little nervous to ask people. Um, but we we're just so happy and so grateful that you said yes mm -hmm. um and jumped into this with us um and i just yeah i knew that each of you um uh would understand mm -hmm. you know what this what this kind of event is like uh what's you know meant to be so thank you so mm -hmm. much um thank you to everyone um who came um who listened who watched our powerpoint <laughs> oh yeah thank the you. powerpoint yeah that was <laughs> a piece of the night yeah. <laughs> um yeah we really appreciate it we we're just we really wanted to like do something joyous together mm -hmm. and have wanted to do that for a long time so getting to be in the same room was already such a win and then getting to do this was just the biggest boost in the world yeah. and the three of you are just people that I feel like we've all like like looked up to and like looked with um and felt really like things were possible with. yeah you've all taught us yeah what friendship means mm -hmm. right um in your own ways and heartful ways. Heartful. <laughs> Which is a word. I know, I put that on my poster and someone texted me and was like, that's not a word. And then we looked it up and it was. Marion Webster <laughs> says it's a word. Heartful. And even if it isn't. So what? It sounds nice. <laughs> so thank you for your heartful words yeah. and presences. You all are inspiration. You're so lovely beyond words. I hope everyone gets to take a look at the Zoom time. Thank you. And we're working on another collaborative chapbook. So who knows? Yeah. Exciting things. Exciting things are coming <laughs> for the universe. All right. <laughs> we're going to say bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. bye. Thank you bye. so much. Bye. Sending love. Thanks for the chat box. It was amazing. Also, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>